Um, well, let me introduce Dr. Alex Travis. He's an assistant professor, um, your genetics or bio reproductive biology, reproductive biology at um, number one veterinary school in the United States. It's uh, Cornell. And uh, <laughs> he graduated from Princeton University with magna cum laude. However, so meaning that he was number one student there, however, he wasn't, uh, he still had time to date, and he has a wife a, and a wonderful kids. You have two right now, right? Three. Three, Three. yes. So obviously he's uh, very experienced in reproduction. Uh, he, uh, he did a very prestigious uh, fellowship in the Monash University in Australia, which is, which is pretty much a competitor of us. They are, they are very good in men's health. And uh, more recently, then he did a PhD and a vet school at the University of Pennsylvania. However, the dean of Cornell doesn't hold it against him, and he still took him on the staff. And most recently, uh, he started in 2003 establishing his lab and was awarded a very prestigious Pfizer Award for research at the veterinary, veterinary school. He's going to give us a talk about whether we can take the testes from the boys and uh, put it in naked mice. Thanks, Darius. So uh, uh, I just want to thank all of you for uh, your attention in coming today, and of course KSNA for, for giving me this opportunity to share some of our work. And um, you know, there's, there's one main difference between myself and other clinicians here, and that's this little letter right there, the V. As Darius mentioned, I'm a veterinarian, and so most, when I did practice, most of my patients had fur or feathers or scales. Um, I've, I've kind of backed away from clinics uh, to do more basic science. But because I am a clinician um, by training also, I, I have this need to do what, what Peter Schlegel pointed out at the very beginning, the translational work that bridges the basic science up to being, having clinical application. Uh, one thing that's always um, really been a passion of mine is, is actually wildlife conservation. And uh, I did my PhD in, in sperm biology, how sperm work, how they become able to fertilize. And if we have a genetically valuable animal like this tiger, well, how can we preserve its genes in its population? And the answer is, well, we can save the sperm and, and freeze them and use them for artificial insemination or in vitro fertilization. Um, and that's, that's great, but what happens if you have a litter of tiger cubs that are genetically valuable, but they die? And these are animals before puberty, so they haven't produced sperm yet. There's actually some species of cat that, that have a lot of neonatal mortality in, in captivity. And how can we save their genes so these populations don't disappear? And about 10 months ago, I was having dinner up at Cornell, and uh, this was uh, one of the real benefits of launching the center that, that Paul is uh, the director of on reproductive genomics, bringing the reproductive biologists from Weill together with the folks up at the vet school and throughout the, the Cornell campus up in Ithaca. We're having dinner. I'm sitting next to Darius talking about our, what we do in our lab. And he immediately saw a link between what we do to preserve the genes and, and potential to be fathers for, for these animals with humans and human medicine, and, and in particular, the Kleinfelter case. Because, again, most of those patients don't have a lot of, of sperm production, although certainly some can be um, isolated. And um, I'm going to... Uh, You've heard a lot of terms today, and, and Darius, uh, you know, in planning this, was very smart, and I saw this as the talks progressed, because you've had a, a number of things introduced to you already in time for my, in time for my talk. You've had the concept of stem cells and meiosis and, and all these different parts, and I'll just use this diagram to kind of put them together. The stem cells um, that will become, uh, in a sense, the grandfathers of, of the sperm, the cells that will be producing the cells that will become sperm, are found in these tubules, these seminiferous tubules, and um, then they will empty into a collecting duct system and eventually be ejaculated out. And these Leydig cells exist in the spaces in between these tubules. Now the stem cells that are now different, these are not the Leydig stem cells of which you just heard, these are spermatogonial stem cells. They are found on the outer edge of the seminiferous tubules, and being stem cells, they can divide um, to reproduce or replenish their own population while also producing progeny cells that will then become sperm. And what's interesting about them is that they're found in the testis throughout a male's entire life. So from birth 
um, and up, not like sperm, which are only found at puberty and, and after. And so um, in looking at this, in a, again, this is a scanning electron micrograph um, taken of a single seminiferous tube. You can see some of those lighting cells in between, one of the blood vessels up here. But this is a single tubule and has a basement membrane. And here, these cells, some of these cells right on the edge of this basement membrane, those are the stem cells. Those cells will then enter into meiosis and produce the spermatocytes, some of the cells that um, Paula Cohen was talking to you about. These are the guys that are undergoing uh, those recombination events and um, in the first meiosis, and then eventually going into spermatids, and then you see a whole bunch of sperm tails here. Those are from sperm that are a little actually further back in the plane. And in between are these Sertoli cells, which nurse the germ cells along and help them produce sperm. But if we can somehow harness this, the powers of these stem cells, perhaps we could have a way of preserving uh, fertility. Now the advantages here, again, are being stem cells, they potentially provide a renewable source of sperm, and also they can be harvested from immature animals that die uh, before producing sperm. Now there's several different approaches we're taking um, to developing technologies based on this, and the one I'm going to talk about today is called testis xenografting. The reason I'm going to focus on this is because it not only um, provides a model, say, to produce sperm, potentially, but it really provides an experimental model to tie in these kinds of clinical research that you heard about earlier on with different kinds of hormonal modulations, different drugs to uh, perhaps inhibit certain enzymes, or directly um, uh, supplementing hormones. And it also provides then a study system where you can do different things and look at the effects without having to actually do them potentially in a patient uh, themselves. Now, again, this is just to recap. The, none, nothing happens by itself in the body, and the test is certainly works in close harmony with the pituitary gland and the brain. And um, what we have then is, is basically um, a hormonal cascade where um, the hypothalamus tells the pituitary to make hormones called LH and FSH, and then these tell the testis, um, the lytic cells to make testosterone, and the Sertoli cells to make different things like androgen binding protein and inhibin. And this is something that wasn't mentioned so far today, but I'll just throw it out briefly. This is one way that the testis keeps testosterone higher in that local environment within the testis. The Sertoli cells actually make this, which binds androgens, and it locks them up and keeps them inside these tubules. So this is a complex system again. Now, what we can do with testis xenografting is actually take small pieces, and I'm talking about maybe one to two millimeter cubes of testis, and take them from a donor. In our case, mostly we use uh, cats and dogs, and put them into special mice. And this is where Darius has been making jokes about nude mice, naked mice. Nude mice are a strain of mice that don't have fur. And that's why they're called nude mice. But really, the important thing about them is that they're missing a large part of their immune system so they don't reject grafts. So you can take a bit of tissue from another species and put them into a nude mouse, and it won't reject it. It won't recognize it as being foreign. And so it will try to help it along as if it were part of its own body. There's also skid mice, and actually some pictures I'm going to show you today are skid mice. These are severe combined immunodeficiency mice. These guys have fur, but they're even missing more of their immune system than the nude mice. And up at the vet school, um, there's different ways to house these. We use these curtained isolators because, again, these animals don't have an immune system, so you have to be very careful in how you handle them. Um, after getting a facility to be able to house such animals, uh, what we then do is, is get testes. And in these cases, we're using, uh, these are actually ferret testes. And sectioning them into these very small pieces. And then um, performing surgery to actually implant these into, into the mouse. And this is a setup we have. And again, this is um, in, a, in a special setup so that the mice are never exposed to any kind of uh, germs. We anesthetize the mice. And then um, these are skid mice, so they have fur. So we clip them and scrub them for surgery, same as any patient would be. And what we do first is we actually castrate them. And um, 
In a mouse, they're very interesting because they don't have a closed inguinal ring. So their testes can drop down into the scrotum or go all the way back up into the abdomen. And if any of you have pet rabbits, that's why rabbits are so often missexed. Um, and why you think you buy two females and you wind up with little baby rabbits is they have the same phenomenon. The testes can either be down in the scrotum or up in the abdomen. So when we perform a castration, we actually do it uh, through the abdomen. And what's nice about that is because, again, we heard about feedback. If you have too much testosterone, say through supplementation of too much, or naturally through their own production, and you try to put a graft in, the natural testosterone in this case is going to suppress it. So what we do is we castrate them, and then we can control their endocrine profile much more exactly, right? And let the graft actually do that regulation for us. So again, we use this abdominal approach for the castration. Then we take these one to two millimeter cubes here, and usually two millimeter, I think, in, in our hands has, has done better. Um, we don't actually, this is um, uh, a suture material that's very, very fine. It's actually used for eye surgery, for uh, surgery on the eye. We don't actually go through the graft. We actually just grab it just on the edge, because we try to keep the architecture of the graft um, as intact as possible. And we put it underneath the skin of the back of the animal. And um, I'll just go through, and then we, we staple them up. And we can put about 10 grafts into a mouse, and they do just great. They live for years afterward, OK? And this is important, because when we're trying to produce, say, cat sperm, um, what we do is we let the graft grow, and then we can retrieve it at different points in time and see what stage are we up to? Are we in meiosis, the, things that, um, the stages that Dr. Cohen was talking about? Or are we further and have we produced sperm? And this is a picture of a uh, mature sperm that's been taken from one of these grafts. And this is now, again, to emphasize this, this is a cat sperm that has been produced in a mouse. And um, what we can then do with those sperm is that process of ICSI, which um, uh, Dr. Schlegel talked about this morning, where we, you have a pipette and you have a sperm in it, and this, this points to actually there's a sperm right here, and we actually literally inject it into the egg, and in that way, hopefully produce offspring. Um, again, we're, what's being grafted is just a piece of the testis. You don't have the epididymis, you don't have any of the accessory sex glands, so the sperm can't be used for, say, in vitro fertilization or artificial insemination. You have to use this process called ICSI. One of the first things we wanted to do is that everyone who, this is a relatively new technique, testicina grafting. It's only been done for a few years. Um, and everyone has used neonatal donor tissue. And that's great if you were just a pure basic scientist and want to develop this technique. But what if you actually want to use it to save the fertility in a clinical setting? Well, then we have to need to know, well, what ages of donor testis tissue will it actually work for? So the first thing we set out to do was look at um, just this question, what we call a donor age curve. And so we looked at donor tissue from cats that had these different ages of eight weeks, nine to 16 weeks, five to seven months, and eight to 15 months. Five to seven months is puberty in the cat. And what we found was that only the prepubertal donor tissue would actually work using this method. When we used a um, pubertal tissue or adult tissue, these grafts degenerated. And uh, just uh, um, in hearing the, the last talk on testicular stem cells, one of the things that we actually noticed when we did these grafts is that it looked like we got some kind of clonal expansion of the Leydig cells in a lot of the grafts. And certainly these grafts produced enough testosterone to maintain the secondary sex characteristics of these mice. So these grafts, even though they're very, very small, when you put them in, we can put in about eight of them, 10 of them in a mouse, they will grow in size. But even if you add them all together, they'll never be the size of a full mouse testis. But they will produce enough testosterone um, to maintain, say, the seminal vesicles and the accessory sex glands in that mouse. However, at five to seven months, they will produce testosterone, but we don't get spermatogenesis. So there's something very interesting going on that there might be 
changes in the seminiferous tubules that are actually a little apart from the changes that are going on in the Leydig cells. But then when we see an adult, then the whole system shuts down. Now, to make this practical for the conservation of cats, again, because this is where most of my research has been, the first step is, well, what donor ages can we use? And we've kind of answered that question. We think those are the best times. Um, excuse me, how long we leave it in the mouse after, after the procedure. We've determined the donor ages. And now we're working to assess the function. All right, are these sperm actually functional? Can you use them to produce offspring? Unfortunately, this is where some aspects of veterinary medicine lag behind our counterparts in human medicine. Procedures like ICSI and embryo transfer are not as well worked out in animal models as they are in people, actually. And uh, so we are doing this in collaboration with pretty much the only lab in the world that does ICSI in cats, which is down at the National Zoo. The next step, then, is to talk about, once we get these steps worked out, cryopreservation of testis sections. If you want to preserve the fertility of these individuals, well, you may not want to preserve their fertility right now. You may want it to be 10, 15, 20 years from now. Um, and for that, we need a way to cryopreserve the testis sections. And some labs have done this on a limited basis and had uh, some success. Now, I pointed out uh, before that sperm production um, can uh, vary uh, depending on donor age. It doesn't just work in cats. This is a picture of ferret tissue. Uh, ferret sperm, actually, that are produced in a xenograft. This is a close-up. This is a, uh, um, a lower mag view, so you can see lots of sperm produced here. Um, what's interesting about this is that in all species that have been studied so far, the procedure seems to work fairly well, least well in the cat. So I was very unfortunate in choosing that because we made it a little hard on ourselves. Um, but there does seem to be some variation between species. And what is important is that then things get done in appropriate models. And so what are the potential uses for humans if we want to move a technology like this to human medicine? So the first one uh, that um, is being looked at is in cases where young boys have cancer, are going to be exposed to a chemotherapeutic drug that's going to make them sterile later on, or perhaps if they have to remove the whole testis, if it's uh, testicular cancer. There are, um, there's at least one lab, maybe two labs, who are actively looking at this as a rationale for doing testis xenografting using primate and human samples. Another approach is to actually use this if we're developing new drugs, new chemotherapeutic uh, drugs or new treatment protocols for different diseases and you want to see what are those effects going to be on human reproduction. Well, rather than give those drugs to people and potentially cause them illness, could you just give them to a mouse that has a little bit of human tissue in it and then look at the effect on the human tissue. Genetic diseases. We can use these then as a model. Instead of having to go in and from the same individual take biopsies again and again at different points through their life, could we just take one set of biopsies, put them into a mouse model, and then extract them over time, saving much physical and uh, um, emotional toll on uh, repeated procedures in humans, and study the course of genetic disease. Why is it that during puberty in Kleinfelters that we have this depletion? of the germ cells. And then, of course, finally, studying potential treatment options for diseases affecting male reproduction. What is interesting about this um, uh, potential is that there's a, and as, as Paula Cohen pointed out, there's so much variation between people. And that's a big problem when you're looking at new treatments. Because what one person has as a response to a drug might not be the same as, the, as another. And it's not just that, say, their testes are responding differently, but their whole genetic profile that maybe has them metabolize the drug differently in the liver, things like that. All of that has to get somehow swamped out by a large sample size. 
In a, in a model like this, for example, you could take little pieces of biopsy specimens and put them in a few different mice and therefore test several different treatment regimens on the tissue all from one donor. And then you factored out that individual variation between the human donor. So what's already been done in primates? And unfortunately, not a lot. Um, it has been noted that there are some species differences between rhesus monkeys and um, marmosets, which are the two main models that have been looked at so far. Uh, tissue sample availability is, um, is as you imagine, difficult. Uh, mostly, um, uh, most people will not just sign up for a testis biopsy. Um, pathology samples do require sometimes years of, of um, institutional uh, review board or the IRB panel um, acceptance. And primate research does cost a lot of money. If you want to house a colony of monkeys specifically for something like this, it can get very, very expensive. So this is um, really the highlights of all the primate work that's been done in testis xenografting. And you'll notice that all of these are very recent studies, all within the past five years. Um, first, the paper published was that marmoset xenografts will begin spermatogenesis. The, probably the uh, best uh, paper in my mind um, was that rhesus monkey sperm production is accelerated in xenografts. This is very interesting because if you take a piece of testis from a neonatal animal or a prepubertal animal, and you take it, say, from a primate, which is not going to hit puberty for a few more years, right? And you put it into a mouse, the mouse is going to hit puberty a lot faster. And so they get ex the graft will get exposed to a pubertal and an adult hormonal environment much faster than actually if that testis were just left in the donor. So you can actually get accelerated sperm production in a xenograft versus if the testis were just left in that original donor. And this is important in terms of setting up studies because we'll have to potentially factor in what kind of endocrine profile are they going to be seeing and can we use that to our advantage perhaps to study the effects at the time of puberty. Um, this was a documentation that uh, xenografts can actually uh, provide a good model for the effects of chemotherapeutic drugs so that by adding a drug like busulfan into a mouse, which would knock out stem cells in, in a human, it would actually do the same thing in the mouse um, that's carrying those xenografts. It was shown um, adult human xenografts do not produce sperm, and that matched our donor uh, curve that we did in the cat. And um, rhesus monkey testis tissue could be cryopreserved, then used for xenografts. Unfortunately, this was um, perhaps a bit optimistic, spermatocytes were the most advanced cell seen. They did not get mature sperm in that study. Um, and spermatocytes are undergoing meiosis. So a little more work, I think, clearly needs to be done uh, along these lines of, of preserving testis tissue. So can we use this model as a tool for helping us either understand um, genetic diseases, such as Klinefelter's, and um, what questions could we ask? Can we not only understand the disease, can we ask questions that will help us develop treatments? And then I am not just, again, a, a, a basic science scientist. I have the clinical training, and that kind of makes me a little um, less patient, perhaps, than some of my brethren as, as clinical scientists. So I'm, I'm always interested in what can we do now? What can we actually take from the basic science and, and move it forward? And some of the questions that we could answer in the relatively short term, well, what happens to prepubertal human testis xenografts when they're exposed to an adult endocrine profile within a mouse? In this way, we could then study the germ cell depletion phenomenon that occurs around the time of puberty. Now, can we track the course of the germ cell depletion and understand its pathogenesis? So again, instead of having to take repeated samples from the same individual person, over time, can we actually just put in 20 grafts in mice and take a few out at different time points? 
What are the effects of different hormonal manipulations on spermatogenesis? Now, I'm not smart enough to do that by myself. I will need the help of endocrinologists. I'm not an endocrinologist myself. But that's the benefit of, again, pulling together this kind of team approach that's being encouraged here at Cornell, not just the folks doing basic science, but the clinicians, endocrinologists, all around um, the institutions that participate together in this. And how is testosterone production in the xenografts? Is it going to be normal? We can actually look at, there are biomarkers for this, which I mentioned before, the seminal vesicles. In a castrated mouse, the seminal vesicles will shrink to you know, five milligrams in weight, whereas in um, an intact mouse, there'll be 250 or 300 milligrams in weight. In the xenografts I showed you, most of those produce enough testosterone that they keep those seminal vesicles around 200 to 250 milligrams. So we actually have a biomarker for functional testosterone, and that's important because on a daily basis, testosterone doesn't do this. Testosterone does this. So if you draw a blood sample at a specific time, you don't know whether you're up here or whether you're down here. And so by using these biomarkers for testosterone production, we can actually see the functional effects they're having in the body. And then finally, we could actually begin to look at cryopreservation protocols for primate tissue or human tissue. And again, the reason for this is you can try protocols in a human, with human samples now, and you may not want to recover them for 15, 20 years. In an experimental model such as this, you can freeze them for a few months, pull them out, and see if they would grow. And in this way, instead of having that really costly to the patient experiment where you do freezing protocol X and you have to wait until they want it 20 years later before you're going to assess function, you could do something like this and test a number of different cryopreservation protocols, figure out which one seems to work best, and then say, OK, we recommend this one as of now, and we can continue to work on it. Um, that's just a, a kind of a, a brief overview of, of some of the potential um, questions, really, that we can ask and answer, hopefully, with a model like this. Uh, of course, as with any science, there, can only, there cannot be promises as to results. There can only be promises as to questions uh, that, that we can um, try to answer through these. Um, I'd like to acknowledge certainly KSNA uh, for bringing us all together. Uh, Catherine Henry, who I emailed with a, a number of times, um, certainly uh, Darius and Peter here at, at Weill um, Cornell, uh, Darius especially for, again, thinking outside the box enough to try to bring in a lot of different people working in different areas. Again, I had never um, really thought about Kleinfelter at all um, before speaking with Darius. And then folks in my lab, uh, Jackie Nelson and uh, Yunhee Kim, who actually do the work while I sit at the computer and, and uh, you know, write grants and things like that. And if there's any questions, please. I've read in the literature that um, XXY horses, boars, and monkeys. Is there any use in studying animal models that are naturally occurring, naturally occurring XXY animal models? And what would we be looking at if we could do it? Right. So that, I mean, that's an interesting question. And I might have to turf a little bit of this to Paula, so I'll give you a heads up. I think that the numbers, uh, from what I have understood, are, are very rare on, on most of these things. Um, and the vast, vast majority of them would not be picked up. So in terms of being a model, it would be exceptionally rare samples that you would find. And unfortunately, it would make it, unfortunately, it would make it difficult to, um, you, you couldn't have necessarily a colony, uh, you know, uh, in terms of, of having a research colony to be able to study over a longer term. Um, Paula, do you have any add-ons to that? Well, I'll just I'll defer it back to you in a second. Uh, Vicki myers Wallen's doing some stuff in dogs, right? Is she, is so she works on, um, yeah, so we have a colleague uh, up at Cornell who actually works on um, inherited diseases of sexual development in dogs. 
And there are, um, and what she's trying to do is find genes that cause sex reversal um, syndromes um, and intersexes where a gonad will have both ovarian tissue and testicular tissue. Um, yeah, so there are some models that, that could be uh, developed. But again, what you have to do is you have to identify that, um, that patient, if you will, um, the animal who has the problem, and then actually be able to get it um, and breed it repeatedly to, to develop a colony. And some uh, genetic diseases lend themselves more or less favorably to those studies. So, so I will add to that and say that you know, uh, Quinnell's heavily involved in the dog genetics program. I mean, one of the major players. And, and uh, you know, we, we've traced dog lineages so, you know, dog lineages are so well kept because of breeding and all this thing, uh, this sort of thing that, that as we understand dog genetics more, we're going to find diseases that are associated with one breed versus another. Um, we may not know about much about them now, but we will do, and I think the same goes with any other animal. I think that monkeys, for example, will turn out to have many, many different types of chromosomal abnormality analogous to humans. We've just never looked before, and it's only now that we're identifying the genes that we can begin to do it. And I think your point is absolutely valuable. It's really important to find these commonalities. Um, you know, every every eukaryotic species is trying to propagate the species to the next generation, but we have these all very conserved mechanisms, but also very diverse mechanisms, and we need to find what those similarities and differences are, and I'm sure there'll be similar uh, phenomena. I think Darius had a comment. I mean, it's an excellent question, and um, I collaborate a little bit with Mao Gosha Pozor. She's a uh, um, horse, how do you guys call the infer infertility? Theriogenologist? Yes, there's a very complex word, but she's actually a very, very good scientist looking at horses. She's at the University of Florida, and I actually asked her the same question. And, and what she said that, you know what, that um, our goal is not really to help horses, you know, to help the humans. And the problem is that the genes which are on the X chromosomes in humans are not the same genes on the X chromosome which are in horses, because in horses it does occur. You know what I mean? So from the basic science, it's important but at the same time, it's very hard to translate uh, phenotypical changes and kind of some of the characteristics just from the horse to the animal. That's, that's you know, one of the problems with this. So what Alex is doing, I think it's, it's much more promising because it allows you to actually study a human tissue and, you know, and, and that's the real goal, you know, because that's the, the easiest approach from what we find, find in the lab to the bench and clinical application. Yeah. Would you? No, I would agree with that, definitely, and, and it's the most direct. Um, the dog is probably the best model otherwise. Um, you know, people have bred dogs to look like, you know, you have the wolfhounds, then you have the chihuahuas, and they all have inherited diseases that are different. Um, so unlike a mouse where you knock out a gene and then say, what happened? In the dog, we have all these mutants, which are the breeds. And um, they all have predispositions to diseases. And there's over 400 diseases that have direct homology to human disease. Um, so we're just waiting now that the dog genome has been done to mine that. And uh, so hopefully some of our work will also go towards developing transgenic dog models and things. So that would be the species to me that I would probably emphasize the most. Um, but the most direct route is going to be looking at um, human tissue. Alex, if I can ask you a question, if you could go back to your slide about the experiments, are you turn it off already? Yeah, just so just tell me, tell me when. So if I understand well, that when you put a prepubertal testis, so let's say you know an 18-year-old or 7-year-old boy in the mice, right? You had a sustained growth up to five weeks or 50 weeks. Uh, I mean, the sustained division that was the best. So, right. So that was cat tissue. Oh, cat right? tissue, of and, course. Yeah. Right. And so what we saw was. Um, it was very, very interesting. So when you put them in, we got actually an acceleration of spermatogenesis because you're taking a prepubertal piece of testis, putting it into a more adult environment. So you got a little bit of an increase in spermatocytes, and then it dropped off. And then it took a longer time, but around by 42, 3 weeks plus, you would find sperm. You still find sustained production. 
in so, this right. group. Now, what's interesting about it is there's no outflow tract. You have a little piece of testis in there, and it actually makes a little capsule around itself. But there's no epididymis. So you don't, and that was a problem, that was a big mistake we made right at the beginning, because we said, well, we'll leave until 50 weeks, we'll collect more sperm. But the sperm had started to sit there a little too long, and there was a little pressure buildup probably, and you start to then get uh, necrosis from pressure. And so now we've backed off and are now testing 35 to 45 week old grafts because those ones, they're fewer in number, but they're fresher and probably a lot more functional.